Hey everyone, welcome to episode 36. My name is Kay Shiv and I'm the producer. Today's episode is with the Dalhousie Accounting Marketing Team, which inclu includes Kate Lee, Emma Balancic, Thomas Monroe, and Terry Trevers. This episode includes behind the scenes details on how the team marks your assignments, tests, and exams, while also providing a little bit of an introduction to who they are, what they do on a daily basis, and, and they do that through sharing some of their personal interests, goals, and past achievements. I've uh, linked all of their details in the description to uh, the episode, so feel free to connect with them and reach out to them if you'd like. They're happy to chat um, and, and share some more details with you. Thanks, and enjoy this episode. Good evening, everybody. I have, what do I tentatively call this? The Dal Marker Podcast, Secrets of the Marking Process Uncovered, or something like that. So cheesy, go big or go home. Um, but that's really the theme of this is, um, you know, we're going to release this to our learners, our audience, uh, our management learners. We want to empower them, make them set big goals and hopefully give a little bit of a boost of confidence to go get them. And I know about um, me when I was in school, you kind of worked really hard, you studied, you did your test, and then it went somewhere and you got back a grade. And there wasn't always that connect between what you did and what you got back or sometimes there was and sometimes there wasn't and it's like I love that I've worked with each and every one of you as learners and then on the other side in various aspects of CPA and his marking so like here's your chance like unfiltered um, to connect with our learners in a different way because you've been able to you know grow yourselves and grow and help them grow and so like let's let's unveil whatever secrets and hopefully um learners will be like oh yeah like that is um that is what an a circle means that's an angel mark or like that's that's who's there um so while we start off let's do a general intro and go around the table introduce ourselves maybe talk about uh where you graduated from haha uh who you want to talk about where you work now um anything that you'd like to kind of say a few words about yourself maybe we'll go with thomas first just to make sure his uh sound we were doing a little sound check before but um not sure if we grabbed thomas so do thomas first and then we can always circle back to him at the end if he has to do some uh sound stuff so thomas you are up okay can you guys hear me all right all right that was good timing um, so, uh, where should I start? Um, I went to Dow. I had just graduated in May of 2021, so about a year ago. Um, I started work, um, in that, in the fall of 2021 with, uh, Irving and then, um, around the new year, I transitioned into, uh, Grant Fortin's tax. And that's where I am now. And I'm going through the CPA program there. Um, and I'm about to start the core two module. Um, so that's a brief overview uh, of my timeline in the past, let's call it two years. Um, but I was in a bunch of classes with Sam. Um, well, basically every, every class that Sam taught I was in during my accounting degree, so. Yeah, you didn't have a chance to to kind of, yeah, get out of some of those. Um, no. Any memories? I have a Beanie Baby memory. Beanie Baby, really? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll hold that and uh, get back. Emma, when I say Beanie Baby, does that click any bells with you? It reminds me, it was someone's nickname. That's what I remember. Or am I wrong? No, you, I think you were right. Cause um, we'll go to Emma next. Um, so thank you, Thomas, sorry. <laughs> because <laughs> um, your memories from undergrad um, and I'll circle back and we'll, don't worry I promise um, Beanie Babies we were talking about split off costs in cost management and um, the whole like room was kind of like not not having my pre-planned lecture so then I'm like you know what F it split off costs you know what has split off costs agriculture you live, you grow, and then at some point, sometimes you split off the cost. So you have some sheep and you can like shear the sheep and then the sheep can either get more wool or you can like kill the sheep and you can eat the sheep. So we had all these like talks and then apparently um, Anna Keshev, um, Thomas uh, and Emma, apparently one of your like group found a Beanie Baby sheep um, and was passing around pictures. And then that's kind of where um, Beanie Baby kind of came up from. 
So, okay. So I just added that you were part of the cost class. And um, so, yeah, how about you talk a bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. So I graduated from Dow back in May of 2021. So somewhere, Thomas, about a year ago. Uh, I currently work at Grant Thornton in assurance. I actually did my first co-op there and then I went back after graduating, which is really exciting. Um, I'm currently starting uh, Capstone One in May. I did the Queen's GDA program, so I fast-tracked it. And so far it's been pretty cool working and not having to study. That was a really nice benefit, but definitely it was a grind past summer. Um, and one of my favorite memories from undergrad, I would have to say was doing JDCC and going to St. Catharines and getting to compete. It was really cool seeing everyone do their presentations and just getting to hang out with everyone and just be typical university students. Yeah, um, I had the pleasure of working with you as your accounting coach there, this very first met. And yeah, no, that was JDCC in St. Catherine in like um, so Niagara Falls, January of 2020 before the world shut down. Yeah, that was that was my last like vacation, my last like time away. So neat. Okay, Thomas, I'm cycling back to you. Uh, memory from undergrad. I think um, one of the fondest memories I have from undergrad is when I transitioned from engineering to accounting with a buddy of mine. And we both had no idea what we wanted to study going into our second first year, just to restart the program. And we were sitting in um, Prof Powers uh, Accounting 101 class. And we walked out of that class and we both looked at each other and went, I really like this stuff. This stuff clicks. And we both were, and from that point, we're still um, really passionate about it. And that, that class and that first sort of experience of the field um, turned us on um, into, the, into the study. So that was probably a big, big memory for us. That is, yeah, absolutely. Because the cool thing about having a second first year is you have the perspective of like, okay, I'm in it to win it. Like I'm, I'm out here shopping. Like I'm not, you know, just window shopping. Like I, I want to purchase something. So that's, that's a really neat perspective. Thank you. All right, Terry, you are up. I also dabbled at Dalhousie University. I have a piece of paper with my name on it that says I graduated from there. Um, I currently work at Amera in internal audit in the SOX program, also doing the CPA program. Um, what, are they, what else are we telling about ourselves? I don't remember the prompts. As where you are in your CPA journey and memory from undergrad. And if you, you want to share uh, like a bit about your undergrad or you can talk about um, um, something, a memory that stands out for you, um, anything there. So I just finished writing core two. So I will hopefully be doing PM or finance in July, I think. And then I'll go into assurance and then all the other fun stuff. Um, I think my favorite memory from my undergrad was coming back to Dow from RMC and like realizing that I made the right choice. So it was, I went to Dow and then went to RMC and didn't like the education. So I came back to Dow. So finally getting to back to Dow into the row and back into classes was a, was an awesome experience because it felt, felt very good to be back. Yeah. Oftentimes students will ask like, how do I know if I made the right decision or, you know, what do you think I should do? And I, I think sometimes, um, not sometimes, but oftentimes it's good to solicit information to, you know, put yourself in different situations, but like when it feels right, then it's like, that's confirmation. Okay. Like this is the next step. This is it. And then when it doesn't feel right, okay, what could feel right? And can I try that out low stakes or do I have to do some higher stakes or what do I think will feel right? And kind of collecting that information. So that's a good gut check. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. Miss Kate. So we have, um, and I should mention that all of our marketing team here um, are people that have been involved marketing this past year, um, either IFA2, uh, 
not cost, um, but, uh, or AA2, so advanced accounting two, and some markers uh, were new this semester, and some have been with me um, pretty much since the day they wrote uh, their first or their last, like AA2 test, and I snagged them to be on my team. So with that, Kate Lee, um, tell me about your journey, a um, bit about when you graduated, uh, what's up for work, where you're at in your CPA journey, and a memory from undergrad. <laughs> so I graduated in 2019 um, and I'm currently with EY in their Halifax office in their assurance practice um, and I successfully wrote the CFE in September 2021 so I'm just in the process of paperwork applying for my actual letters I have my work experience so um, almost done that and I guess a memory from undergrad um, I was very fond when we went to Splitties after the tax exam. Oh, that, that was a memory? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you have a good memory. I don't know if my memory is that good. Yes. I think that that is an excellent memory. I, I'm, are you, you're going to stop there, right? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> What's cool about your CPA journey um, and what's cool about everybody's here is, um, even though that's not the point of the podcast, is it was all different. So Kate, you decided because you were like, oh, you had a lot, like the world was your oyster and there was a lot of things going on, possibly fast tracking, possibly doing the modules uh, one by one. Uh, what did you decide to do um, after you graduated? I decided to not fast track. Um, I just took my summer off. I went to work and I did all of the core modules and the electives um, kind of on, I guess, like the CPA schedule um, with other people in my firm. Yeah. And so what's cool and what I want to highlight for everybody kind of listening is that, you know, we have firm uh, CPA schedule, you know, um, we have GDA quote fast track, we have firm, um, you know, uh, more modules, but like earlier on in the process. And then we have industry um, kind of going through and doing um, modules during quote, what's busy season, but not busy season because it's internal audit. Like you do you, right? So we talk about that like little feeling and, you know, I, I won't stick this question out there, but I will just say um, from my own experience and from all the students that I keep in touch with or that, you know, that I went through with is that it's just hard. It's a hard program. So no matter when you do it, it will be hard, um, but it's also worth it, right? So it's hard, but worth it. And so there's no like, how do I say it? No shortcut, no getting out of it. <laughs> no easy way. <laughs> Just you do you. All righty. Uh, so Emma and Terry, this first question is gonna go to you. Um, what is one thing that you wish you had known when you were an undergrad? So no direction, take this whichever way you want to go. I think for me, it would be that, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but things don't matter as much as you think. Like if I got a bad mark, I would really like beat myself up and be upset about it. I'd waste the energy on that instead of trying to realize what I did wrong. So I think like looking back now, my GPA that I worked so hard for has not come up in conversation once. Nobody I do CPA with cares about my GPA. So I think like, obviously try and do your best, but if sometimes things happen, it's not the end of the world to, you know, maybe get a 70 instead of a 90. I like when you said, as long as you do your best. Right? And that doesn't mean sacrifice all your friends and don't watch TV and be in the library 12 hours a day. It means make a plan, do your best to stick to the plan. If the plan changes, adjust the plan. But, you know, our best looks different every day and it's okay. And if your best one day winds up looking like a 70 or a 50 or a 30 or whatever, okay. You know, uh, and I'm sorry that nobody's asked you to look at your GPA. Um, but it's like, sorry, not sorry, right? Because it, it matters to as much as it matters to you and to as much as it matters um, as you allow it to other people sometimes. 
you know, um, and there's always a way to frame things. There's always story, like a way to explain, like, listen, that was a hard semester for me. Or listen, I had a bad test and I let it derail me. And this is what I did to come back. Everybody loves the comeback story too, right? As somebody who had like a, a C minus or whatever in computer science, I like, I, I don't know what I had. I had like whatever the bottom grade was that you kind of like squeak into the next one. And I can add and subtract in binary, but dear goodness, if I knew what like the secondary name was for the on off switch, right? Like, but it's a story and it, it, it came up like once when I was an undergrad and then never again um, when I graduated. So the things that you think matter, maybe don't they matter, but not maybe as much as you think they do in the moment. That's great advice. Emma, same question to you. Something you wish you would have known as an undergrad. Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, the one thing I really wish I knew was uh, just how much free time I was going to have. Just jumping straight into undergrad, like, hear me out, it's a bit funny, but just jumping straight from like a very structured kind of life, you know, you're living with your parents, you like go to school for eight hours a day, then you usually have some extracurriculars and going to university, your free time is not necessarily like, oh, I can do nothing, but just like how you allocate it so you have class and then you have grocery shopping but just kind of figuring out that whole lifestyle can be really difficult and like terry was saying sometimes you know things happen with your marks and whatever and because you have this kind of freedom to choose how you want to study and how you want to allocate your time based off of your free time it's just you get a lot more out of it and you learn how to maximize it better i wish i'd known that going into university because i remember my first year just kind of going like what do I do for three hours in between classes? Like this has never happened before. So yeah, that's what I think. Just learning how to really block your time, use it well, enjoy being able to go to the grocery store at 2 p.m. because you can't do that anymore <laughs> once you graduate. But yeah, that's what I would say. That's great advice. Thank you. And I like how you also geared it towards first years because this uh, upcoming year will be my first time teaching first years since I started. So uh, teaching some... Uh, 11, 1101s in the fall. So I'm pretty, pretty darn excited. Okay. So Kate, I'm going to preface this with, um, I still remember that after you wrote AA2 final, um, you, uh, oh goodness, um, you and three others came up, we ordered sushi, we planned out the NMC hotline and um, fortunately been able to kind of either work on different, either CPA Canada or you know various marketing projects uh, i really think that you have you've seen the gamut as have you know a lot of people are everybody here on the call um for you for a little bit longer since i was kind of in the middle of trying to figure things out so you really got to see me figuring things out for the first time a lot so we were kind of growing alongside each other so what is something that you think students might find surprising about the marking process or yeah just about the whole thing in general I guess that, and something I think, I think it surprised me too, um, is that even though I think we think of accounting as very black and black and white, like this answer is right, this answer is wrong because, you know, numbers, um, I think we give a lot of opportunity in the marking process to mark critical thinking um, and thought processes rather than, you know, did the person arrive at the textbook right answer? Um, and, you know, this is intentional. This is how, for those of you who are going on to CPA, how CPA also operates. Um, and we do our best to see past the right answer and kind of look a lot at the path um, about how you got there. So I don't think, you know, if you're looking at an assignment you submitted or, or a test and you maybe didn't get that exact right answer. Um, I remember being in the boat of freaking out, um, but there is a lot of room um, for critical thinking and that whole process and that story of how you get to that answer um, to be marked. And I think Sam does like a really good job in her courses of kind of um, introducing that because I don't think we're used to that in university. So it may seem obvious to us being on the other side. Um, how does somebody show critical thinking? Writing down like everything, you know, step by step. I'm starting here. Um, you know, just 
yeah. pretty much writing down everything that's going through your brain when you're trying to answer the question. Yeah. No, no, no. And I, cause you're kind of like, well, what, what don't you do? Like, no. Um, and so thank you for the, the kind shout out, um, in the process. Cause yeah, before class, like a, a lot of things, like while it might not feel like I'm kind of guiding you there or showing the thought process or kind of saying, Hey, this is the, so what, or this is why, or why are we doing this? Or this is the, what, this is the why. And then in the test, it's like, okay, maybe I asked a question and maybe you don't know this exact thing, but if you can get kind of close, show me your thought process, show me your things. Like maybe it's numbers, but, um, you know, for the, the year that nobody here represents, um, that really big consult test that everybody's done an all, like a version of, um, in between Kate and, um, your guys' year, um, there was one year where they wrote it. And then the next day they came back and they wrote it all, but in words instead of numbers. Cause I was like, show me your thought process. So there's many different ways. Kate's like, what, whatever comes up, like if you don't know exactly how to answer the question, just do your best and give us something to mark. Um, I know that we all here collectively have shed a tear when you see blank space. You're like, no, what? I can't give you anything. And then as a follow-up, and this can go to anybody here or Kate, if you want to, I just don't want to put you necessarily on the spot, um, at multiple choice questions. That was something um, that the first years, um, I'm not coordinating the course, but my understanding is there'll, there'll be like a lot, if not majority of the tests being in MCQs. And I know that that was something I brought in uh, to our classes that for a portion. So what is some advice just off the top of your heads for MCQs? Um, should they come up in first, third or fourth year? I was really big in just elimination. Um, I don't know. You just, I always have the, I eliminated things that I thought were, you know, obviously wrong. And um, also just focusing on the best because sometimes it's tricky and I could get caught up in saying, well, these are both right. Um, but just really focusing on, I guess, the best rather than what is right because everything could be right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like now the demonstrating of critical thinking is the critical thinking on the process versus like, you know, kind of the other side of that critical thinking. Um, Emma, Thomas, or Terry, do you have any advice um, to add to that great response for how to uh, approach some multiple choice questions? I would add, get it down to two. And then if you're really stuck, you're at a 50-50. Uh, Fair. Yeah, absolutely. And dear goodness, like look at the whole test and think, okay, how many marks are these worth? How much time is this going to take? And if somebody treats like um, a quant, a really big quant with the same amount of time as they like, do not leave anything blank on a test. So like have a once over, because if you're going to spend 10 minutes on one MCQ and you have 29 MCQs and a couple like medium answers, like just sometimes, you just have to like skip it and, you know, come back to it or, you know. And when I went, so I had to write the ACT uh, to get to university. Um, and Emma, I'm not sure if you had to write the ACT or the SAT, but one of the things they taught us in writing that, which is all multiple choice, is to allocate like 30 seconds per question. So if you have, I mean, how much time do you have to write up your exam and how many questions are there and quickly jot that time at the top corner of your page. And that's, that's your limit for every question. Because uh, every question, like your point, is the same weight, uh, generally speaking. So that yeah, was one strategy. The strategy outside of class, the strategy in class, strategy on your exams and within. And it's like, okay, like, and learning learning um, and trying not to make the same quote like mistake uh, and allocating the time. Great, well, Thomas, the next question is also to you. Uh, so I want you to kind of peel back completely. Uh, what is the marking process? Um, what does it look like? Um, okay. So it, it starts off with, um, we close the deadline on the, on the assignment and we usually wait 12 hours, 24 hours before doing it. 
And that's oh, really uh, sorry. Too. Sorry. What's on the marking process with my exams? Oh, there we go. Yeah, uh, Tom, Thomas exam. has been working with another professor, and I was like, that does not sound like Sam's process. <laughs> no, no. Sorry, wrong course. Um, <laughs> wrong course. So with Sam's marking process, the idea is to um, earn marks, not take away marks. So we look at each um, problem on how many marks are available to earn to the student. And we try to, like Kate's point, um, see what you're trying to express, what's your critical thinking in the problem, and does that align with what we see in our solution? And we really do give the benefit um, to the student that they are thinking this through and they're showing what they have studied so hard for. So it isn't a black and white marking process. It's a um, almost like a carry through mark process. And if you are showing that you know the, the subject, you will earn the mark. So it's more of a, a positive than a negative approach to marking. Um, and you're earning your mark, not being deducted your mark. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, appreciate that. Terry, um, do you have anything to add? Just because you have, um, I, I, you've also been with me uh, the longest with the marking process. So you've seen a couple different iterations and you've also seen how it's different um, sometimes from Falls IFA2 to Winter's AA2. So any insights on kind of the intricacies or the behind the scenes of the marking process? I think the main thing is it's mostly like we're always trying to give marks and like, I don't know. I know I'm always asking like, can I give this? Can I give that? And I mean, you started off the whole thing by talking about angel marks. And I think angel marks are a big part of the marking process. And like, you may not have gotten it right, but I can see like, it's kind of like a squeaker. I would call it like, you know, what you did may not have been exactly there, but you were like very close. So I think the main aspect of an angel mark is like show your work so they're easy to give out versus not. But I think the process overall, like it's rather consistent. Like, you know, we'll talk over what's what we're looking for. If things come up, we'll like discuss them so everybody's aware of them. And like it's a very consistent marking process in my opinion that Again, like we're always trying to give marks versus not give them. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I know that we've had different iterations and different um, kind of permutations, but I think generally speaking, we all figure out a night that works best and we all try to get as much as we can get done in one night. And we meet, um, and typically whoever's there first gets the first choice on question and second and third. And so we divvy up the questions where possible. And then you read the questions, mark two, I mark your marking and we talk. If there's more than multiple people on a question, you mark each other's then two to make sure we're consistent. We order some food. And then if we get food on people's exams, we write a little apology notes. Uh, <laughs> really sorry for pizza. Um, and I love it. I love it. Um, you guys always order like the best places. So I, I really love getting that and we make it fun. Because, um, well, anyways, from my point of view, it's fun for me to catch up with all of you. And it's fun um, for me to see your growth and for me to see you all being so generous um, with the students. And yeah, the angel marks are there because, you know, and we, we let them know like a circle because, okay, maybe this wasn't quite right and this wasn't quite right, but of all of it, we can give something. And so communicating that to learner and hopefully it shows like their efficacy to kind of go forward and, and just try. Because I don't know about all of you, but it's like in life, um, it's showing up with a good attitude and trying uh, that opens up more doors than, than not. So Emma, we did something a little bit different for AA2 this time. And it was a weird semester. Um, last two years have all been kind of weird, right? Um, in the sense that online, in-person, online, in-person, but this time we were online but we had an in-person um, version of the exam. 
And um, Thomas and Terry, you were here as well for that. Um, Thomas, you're online. Terry, you came in person. And we gave students the opportunity uh, to write their consolidations uh, exam and to come in and uh, mark it and connect. Sorry, write it and connect, but then come in and mark themselves and then do a debrief. So they could do the flow through um, they could do the flow through errors. They could do the flow through, um, like find all the marks of, that they earned. Emma, how did you find that process in the sense that you were coaching somebody to debrief and mark their own papers and then reflect on that? How does that kind of tie into what we were talking about here? I found, well, going back to the critical thinking skills, it really made the students have to actually sit down and think because we couldn't just give them the answer. It was like, okay, so how did you reach that conclusion? Why do you think that's there? And I think it was a really good activity also to learn how to properly debrief because a part of CPA is debriefing when you write your cases and just them sitting there thinking like, okay, what did I do wrong? How could I fix this? I think it was just a really valuable experience. And they all seem to really understand how valuable it was because they were collaborating with each other. They were coming up with ways to, that they could do better, recognizing weaknesses and strengths that each group had. So overall, I thought it was a really great activity and I think it was a really good chance for the students to really understand how that test worked and how they can improve next time. Thank you. Um, one thing that's selfishly been so nice for me uh, to stay in touch with all of you, uh, to see you learn and grow throughout your careers is also you help me learn and grow in my career. And so when I have, you know, I have some ideas and, um, and so sometimes I will reach out to one of you or a few of you and get your feedback and you're honest in the sense that you're like, oh, that, that might not work or students won't like that, or that's a lot of work for them. Um, or like, okay, that might work, but how about like this? So, um, I really appreciate that feedback because oftentimes we feel like it's, you know, students against prof and the profs holding back the marks and the students are trying to like, you know, claw them. And it's like, a, it's like this mean game when really like we're all in this together. Like everybody can, you know, become the best version of themselves, um, you know, get their goals. Everybody has different goals and you should be really free to have those goals. Like we have people in our classes, every person in here, um, you know, you've had peers that their goal is to pass the course, uh, doing the least amount of work possible. And if that's the case, I might, you know, and I tell them, I'm like, you know, let's aim a little higher just in case you have an oopsies, but otherwise, cool. And then we have other people that are like, I want that, like, I want to feel really proud of my accomplishment and my really proud is a higher bar. Cool. Let's go get that. Um, so, you know, thank you for not only, you know, working with me as learners, but then working with me um, as co-educators to kind of give back and um, make sure I don't steer too far off the path with my good intentions, because, you know, enthusiasm <laughs> without direction, uh, you know, is sometimes is, is not good. So. Thank you there. Okay, to everybody here, we're gonna have uh, some questions. So no, everybody doesn't have to answer every question, um, but just kind of unmute yourself if you see one that you'd like. Um, do you regret completing your BCom in accounting? I can start. <laughs> um, no, not at all. I think I think a BCom in accounting, um, is just it's such a great foundation that can really take you anywhere regardless if you go the CPA route or you don't um, it's a well-respected it's a well-rounded degree um, that shows a lot of discipline and a lot of other skills um, I have a lot of friends who graduated and you know some of them you know with me in accounting and some of them did CPA and they work with me or they work in accounting and some of them went into HR. Um, so I think it really showcases um, a lot of skills. Um, and also I think there's like a really big opportunity right now when we're talking about a BCom in accounting, um, there's a lot of skills that you can mix with accounting that I think haven't really traditionally been done. Um, I think there's a really big opportunity if you're into coding, um, as the industry tries to produce, you know, more valuable and meaningful work. Um, so I just think it's, it's a degree that can really provide a lot of flexibility, um, whether it seems like that on the surface or not. Um, so I personally don't regret it. 
Fantastic. And I love how you, yeah, like your peer group, I know a bunch of them. Some went into sales, like, you know, financial fintech sales or fintech startups. And it's like, you have a foundation where you're fluent and comfortable with numbers and how like the backend works. And yeah, you can pursue your CPA or you don't have to, and you can go to HR or um, business development. And even within the CPA coding, um, the new competency map has um, such a well, like enhanced, you know, we're part of society, we're into sustainability, you know, and making sure that um, the reporting captures those financial and non-financial metrics. I, yeah, I couldn't agree with everything that you said anymore. For some of our more recent grads, any regrets? And would your answer have changed uh, the day after <laughs> or the day before your last test or like maybe last semester when you're in the middle of like senioritis, um, you know, any hope that you can give to people that may be listening to this um, and they're in the schlog of things, like they're, they're in it. I left a free education and a salary to come back and complete it. So I think my answer is pretty obvious, but I just think it's a good foundation. And like- Sorry, Terry, can you, can you repeat that a little bit? Uh, I, I, like when I was in the military, I had a salary and my education was free. And I chose to leave that to come back and pay well, take on debt to get my accounting degree. So I have no regrets doing that. Like going back and looking at that experience, like I wouldn't change anything. I think it's like, I have a good foundation. Everything that got me to the point that I am now gave me a even better foundation. So I have no regrets at all. And I think it just provides you with such a good base to do anything. Like if you think about it, like, so many things that you can do be it accounting or even financial related at all like you can transition so easily with the base in accounting just because it shows you're just like so well-rounded and like problem solving and critical thinking and everything else so like you could upgrade a couple classes and go to physio school if you really wanted to and honestly it would probably look better on your application to have that because they'll be like oh somebody different with a well very well rounded base so yeah, that brings me, that's actually really neat. Um, somebody that has a skill set and then something different. So I have a working theory right now about circles. So bear with me, audience, bear with me, uh, team members. Um, we're all like going for the same circle, CPA. But every year, there's a lot of circles, right? And, and we know that. We know that it's a really well-rounded degree or um, BCom and then CPA. We know it's really good and it provides us a really good foundation, but what will help differentiate you is your hobbies or your first degrees or parts of other courses, your interests, um, your passions. So, you know, then you have the, that circle and now all of a sudden you have like these two overlapping, you know, Venn diagram circles, and then you have a third with another passion or another degree that you did or a degree that you will do. And then where your special sweet spot, where you open up doors for yourself as you continue through your career is that overlap where it's, you know, the shit that lights you up, the stuff that makes you really excited. You have that foundation, you have your passions, you have your skill set that you're building, that you're working, the relationships that you earn and your circles are overlapping. And that sweet spot is your overlap. And um, as much as we all have a lot of things you know, in common here, we all have uh, those things that make us really unique. So um, seeing the BCom as a foundation, as a really solid um, element to build on, I think is uh, something that's been captured really well so far in this conversation. So thank you. Speaking of other circles, you guys do a lot of marking, a lot of work and a lot of, a lot of CPU studying. Uh, any fun hobbies or interests here that you'd like to share? Terry, do you even lift, bro? I dabble. I pick up the odd inanimate object here and there four times a week. <laughs> oh, I power lift. I'm actually going to Newfoundland in May for Canadian Nationals, so that'll be a fun experience. Amazing. One of my favorite uh, quarantine uh, activities was um, watching you um, when you were allowed to like go and have a, a social circle with like two other people being at our friend's house and uh, watching you in a powerlifting meet um, and doing really, really good. So that was a lot of fun. 
What about other people? What What do you like to do for fun? Um, so I guess I'll go. Um, through university, I played rugby, and um, that was such a great uh, physical exercise outlet and a great um, way to meet people and grow some really good friendships. Um, however, it's such a physical sport that when you go through the CPA program, you really want to protect your head, protect your body. And that's not a sport that's all that conducive to that. So what I picked up was cycling. And it's a great um, cardio and actual, um, Terry would know some of the technicals better than I do. But it's a great life workout too. And you're not putting your head in danger, um, especially when you're on such a diligent study path and you're outside. Um, so we're working indoors most of the time and it's kind of a nice excuse not to be working out inside and you're actually out enjoying some fresh air. So that's what I've gotten into. Um, I'd say in the past year and a half, year, um, that's been a great outlet. Nice. And it's funny, uh, the amount of uh, counting majors that also play rugby has increased this year too. So I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like it's a small, a small, powerful contingent and uh, your name has come up to like, oh, do you know Thomas Monroe? <laughs> he used to play rugby. I was like, yes. <laughs> so it's neat. I guess I'll go kind of piggybacking off the outdoor stuff, but uh, usually when the weather's really nice, I really like on the weekends or even on a weekday, just trying to get out uh, and go for a hike or a really long walk around the woods nearby. But hiking is probably one of my favorite physical activities. You really only need a good sturdy pair of shoes and some water and you can have a great time. So that's been a really nice way to decompress after a long week and have something to look forward to on the weekend or even just like a short one after a long day at work. Uh, and usually during the winter, I try and go skiing as much as I can. Uh, I've been skiing here, which has been pretty fun. It's a bit different than from where I from where than from where I'm from, uh, but it's still Colorado. Always... <laughs> yeah, the Rockies. Yeah, <laughs> a little different. Yeah, just a little, but it's been really fun getting to do that. So, one thing I was not good at that I'm so proud of. Um, and I know every week looks different, but I, I didn't, I went from being really physically active in university to slowly not. And I would say, oh, I don't have time or I didn't feel like I had time when the truth was I didn't make time. Um, and just, and I think just starting, right. So just starting or just continuing or so picking up a new one, getting outside, getting excited, being in your body, like it's doesn't, it actually helps right? And, you know, one more hour, one more case, one more of this. It's like, it, it, it's not going anywhere. So uh, kudos to all of you. And um, yeah, because that was something it's like, it's not like it gets any better as you kind of get older and more into your career. It's not like you all of a sudden have like this magic time portal that opens up and gives it to you. Like you literally have to, you have to make it. I think finding a non-negotiable is like so important. Like for me, I don't care how busy I am. Like I am going to the gym on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Like other things are trumped by the gym. Like that's my one non-negotiable. And I think having that is really important for like taking care of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that one non-negotiable to yourself. Also recognizing their seasons. So, you know, just like maybe somebody who doesn't like hiking in, you know, January, and that tends to coincide well with busy season. Um, and maybe if your non-negotiable was like, okay, I want to do five days at the gym in the summer, but I'm okay to do three days in the gym in the fall or something like that. Like your non-negotiables, and maybe this isn't the case, but um, the non-negotiables can go in seasons, possibly, or maybe not. Like if they're your non-negotiables, so you get to choose. The reason I bring up the seasons is because I received a text message um, about two weeks before the tax exam from a, a recent grad and kind of saying, uh, so a couple of weeks ago, and he's like, oh, how do you find 
balance um, when doing CPA uh, during busy season and, and work like working, doing CPA and that. And I just said, you don't have balance right now. Right. And maybe it was the harsh truth, but I was like, you, you don't have balance. You chose to do this for the next four weeks. You don't have balance. You probably didn't have balance before CPA, but you don't have balance now. Like, you know, find out what, you know, find one hobby or one thing you like to do, and you're going to do it in little doses. If that's push-ups beside your desk or reading one page of a, a book a night, like do something to like, you know, but it's not balance, but your balance will be, you know, the next season. So, you know, the balance will be the day or two after you write the exam, overcompensate with the sleep, overcompensate with, you know, going for a really long walk, overcompensate, um, you know, and just look at balance almost like more holistically that way if you find yourself in a situation where you're like whoopsies this was not this was not to plan um what do I do now and kind of taking that that view so if you can go into it understanding your non-negotiables and plan it out really effectively fantastic if you f up like I've done or like my student um would probably say that they did not my words probably theirs um, then understanding, okay, we have to recalibrate and then never do it again. And then set your non-negotiables and go from there and kind of learn and adjust because it's, it's all a process. Is that fair? Uh, so Kate, uh, to you, um, if you'd like, you can either follow up with something you like to do for fun or books or any podcast recommendations you have for students or recent grads. Um, I guess I can do both because um, a book comes to mind that kind of ties into what we were just discussing. But um, just like Emma, I'm really big into hiking with my Springer Spaniel. She loves it too. Um, so yeah, we love that. We love um, camping too. So we've done a couple like backcountry hikes um, and we've kind of hiked in and camped and then hiked back out um, in Cape Breton. So we're planning to do a lot more of that this summer. Um, and then I would say for a book I would recommend, and it's kind of cliche because I feel like everyone's reading it right now, but Atomic Habits. Um, I'm halfway-ish through it. And it's just really interesting. It's basically just a book on creating good habits, um, breaking bad ones. And I guess for grads who are maybe going into the workforce, um, it sounds impossible, but you will feel busier um, than you were in university, just having to spend those, you know, eight hours straight at your desk or at your office. You really want to maximize, I guess, that time that you have to yourself. Um, and I think it's just interesting to see the links between habits and how we can develop them and how we can break them. Um, and it's really helped me maximize the time that, that I have um yeah I think that's an excellent two excellent answers excellent book and um it's isn't it funny there like when you start something and you have a goal and you're like I don't know about you but like sometimes I have goals and there's I'm so far away from where I think I want to be or where I maybe have in the past uh, and then I was in yoga one day and they told the story about the bamboo tree have I told the story of the bamboo tree before okay so the bamboo tree, you plant it, you water it, um, you water it, you water it, you water it. Nothing happens for like the longest time. Nothing. You're almost like, why am I watering this damn thing? And then one day you see a little sprout and you keep watering it. And you're like, oh, okay, okay. And basically it's just exponential, right? It like goes up like five feet, 10 feet, 20 feet. And then it's like 200 feet. And you're like, what is going on? I might be exaggerating, but like, it just goes to show that growth is not linear. You have to put in the work. The benefits will come. Um, it's not one for one, um, but do not underestimate the steadiness, um, just like Atomic Habits discusses. You know, be strategic and stick with it. And, you know, build in those metrics to make it easier, um, be accountable, and, um, and, you know, get out of your own way then and see the growth happen. Totally. And your yeah. something is better than someone's nothing. You always said that to me. So something's better than nothing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We're in this like whole big compare, not we as a society are in this whole big comparison thing. Yeah. So your something is better than somebody's nothing. So like, just go for it.
go for it, live your own life. And uh, the cool thing is somebody um, asked me how I dealt with gossip or the, these things or the other things. I'm like, man, when you're so focused on like your own game and winning. And I was like, the haters are like talking at your back and you're just like, what? I can't hear you. Cause they're not typically brave enough to like see you living your best life and be like, Hey, you suck. Like, no, <laughs> like they're back there like gossiping. And I'm like, I, I have no idea. So yeah. When the student asked me how I dealt with, um, or, you know, um, that there might be concerned with haters. I was like, live your, you live your best life, do your something. And, um, and winning is the best, I guess, revenge or whatever. Like it's not even like revenge. Cause you're like, I don't hear it. Like <laughs> there's gossip here. I have no idea. All right. Uh, to the rest of the group, any books or podcast recommendations you have uh, for students, recent grads, one, um, things that really like light you up. Um, maybe when you're listening on long bike rides or, um, maybe you're like, Sam, I don't want to read a book that I don't have to read for a couple of years. Anything that you're you're scheduling to look forward to? For me, I, I listen to podcasts while at work because I can't focus without them. So I always try and listen to like comedians because it kind of keeps the spirits high personally. But comedians? Of, comedians, yeah. Nice. They'll just like, sometimes I'll like, I don't know, they'll get serious they'll talk about tell funny stories stuff like that so like i mean pretty much every comedian has a podcast so there's lots of them to choose from but uh when it comes to book i listen i got a free trial on audible and i listened to david goggins can't hurt me and it's like the most cliche book and it was very intense but i found it very impactful in the sense of like not that there's no such thing as impossible, but what you think is impossible really isn't. And like being able to push yourself further. And that was like listening to that. And like when I apply it to my own training, especially like, I feel like I got exponentially stronger. Cause it's like, yes, this feels hard right now, but it's like, you're hard at this percent. But in reality, you have so much more to give. So. I was gonna say, doesn't he say something like you're, brain and my trainer used to say this too is like your brain is so much weaker than your body or something like when you think you're done you you're at 60 or you're at 40 percent like it like you have way more to give so you, okay so when you're training you're like no like this is my brain being like like i can do this well that's how like i do it a lot like i train off like the rp scales like rated perceived exertion and like i find my rps are very accurate because i think about like no, this is what I can do. And like, people will be like, oh, this looks like RP this, but then I'm going up another 50 kilos. So it's like just being, I don't know, knowing what's impossible for yourself and not what other people limit you to do. And like, just pushing yourself to achieve what you want to do versus just like not doing it. Absolutely. Hey, um, I think I may have read or reread Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink when uh, you were in my IFA2 class, um, Terry, is, am I remembering a false memory? And I feel like I brought it up in class one day and that you emailed me or we had a discussion about Jocko Willink and extreme ownership. I don't think, I remember you talking about it and I, I know we have definitely talked about it. I have not read that, but I have like watched podcasts with- Podcasts, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's another yeah. one that was like, very good. But one thing I really liked about David Goggins' book on, especially on Audible, was he's the narrator or his, uh, like the person he wrote it with is the narrator and like Goggins comments on stuff and like have discussion about it in between chapters. So it was just like kind of cool to like hear how he wrote it for himself and then hear him discuss like and go into more detail about what was going on in like that time period. Yeah, I would agree. Have you listened to any um, like do you know a bit of the backstory about the book and like the temptations that he received? Um, I, I guess, so I'll just cut me off if this is repetitive, but um, I heard that when he was writing the book and when he wrote the book, um, he tried to sell the book, right? Like as you should, or he tried to sell the rights like when he was outlined and um, many people didn't want to buy it. Um, and then the people that did want to buy it, wanted to buy it all out for, I think like everything, including all the press was $200,000. And at the time he was like, that was a lot of money to me, but this has also been something that's basically my life, my memoir, my like purpose, and would require him to do a lot more work. So it was several years worth of work. 
And he just felt like he wouldn't be getting any residuals. He wouldn't be getting kind of like a fair, like representation of his work. So instead he poured all his money in and decided to self-publish. Um, and really when he talked about it, he was like, I felt like there was nothing else that I could do because the whole book is about going against what's normal, what's possible and pushing the boundaries. So if he didn't do that, he wouldn't be living his truth. And like, I get goosebumps when I think about it. Cause it's like, you know, it's one thing to not just one thing, like it's very inspiring to live your life and to live your truth and to make measured things. But you know, sometimes, um, you know, the meta of all of it is just like, oh, you know, gosh, right. Just when you think you're, you've been tested and it's you know, over, like there's those extra levels. And what do you do when faced with that? So I thought the meta story within David Goggins was also like really inspiring. I think he talked about it in the book or it was on a podcast. Yeah. It was really cool to listen to him talk about like that and how he just said no and like yeah. went for it and doing it. I don't know. I think it just shows you need to like bet on yourself sometimes and like put things out there. I think something that you've always taught, well, I mean, I'll say me, but I'll say us for everyone is like push for what you want mm. and like don't just, you know, sit there in silence. Like if you need help, ask for help or if you want something, like, take it like I got a new contract at work because I said I wanted something and I was like in my mind I didn't say anything for a while because I was like oh I'm never gonna get this but then I brought it up to my manager and I had a new contract by next week so it's like uh, like if you don't ask you'll never get and if you don't bet on yourself you will never succeed so yeah it's self-awareness is important so when you have that voice, it's like, I can bring it. I deserve it. Um, I, I'm bringing this to the table, you know? And sometimes the question is, you know, would you consider, uh, you know, would you consider writing me a new contract? Would you consider, you know, um, you know, paying for these fees? Would you consider, you know, um, switching me to a different department six months out of the year? Would you consider? Um, or it can be a little bit more extreme, right? Um, and I will say that in my own life, um, that the times that I have, I'd not regret because they brought me here and I wouldn't be able to share different lessons. Um, but I have not regretted failing, even if I bet on myself and it didn't work out. Um, but what I have regretted is succeeding according to somebody else's definition of success. Um, so somebody else like said, oh, this is awesome. This is this. And I was kind of like, oh, pro con, pro con. And I didn't listen to that voice. And there was something else I wanted to do and I didn't listen. And then I ended up winning, but it felt like losing. And it, it's interesting. Um, I think we are all in a, we can recognize our privilege in the sense that to have this conversation, to, you know, uh, share these items, um, we are fortunate. A lot of people contributed to where we are at now, and we're trying to come together and, and hopefully, you know, empower people to bet on themselves, to, to take those you know, to, to take the collective, to take the people that have invested in them and to invest in yourself and to give back, right? It's not an either or, it's a giving to yourself, giving back, bringing people along um, for the ride. But yeah, kind of having those check-ins with yourself. Uh, Emma or Thomas, um, any books or recommendations uh, you have uh, for students or recent grads before we go to our last question? I would have two things to say on this. Um, one is a podcast and one is a book. Um, so, uh, the podcast I would recommend is, um, BBC, uh, world news, 30 minute blurb, um, in the morning. And I find, especially during busy season, um, you kind of don't have time to even watch the news. And that isn't the greatest thing because you can really disconnect from a lot of things and that's not good to have. So it is a good sort of right down the middle um, unbiased news that you can listen to while you work. And I listen to that at the beginning of every day. Um, and that comes from a piece of advice that I got when I was 18 or 19. And um, the advice was this guy who had done very well, um, he started his day off um, each day with a newspaper from Globe and Mail and CBC. And he read a couple of the headlines from both. So he wasn't too far off in one direction or the other. 
but he had a good perspective of what was going on in the world today. And I think that's a good thing to, to practice. So if you can find a news channel that gives perspectives uh, from different angles, um, gives the news from different angles, um, I think that's a good way to, to start your day and be aware. Um, book. Uh, I'm a big history nerd. Um, so my books lean in that direction. And one book that I love, um, it's called Shackleton. And it's about uh, the endurance, uh, the ship, the endurance that sailed to Antarctica. And then uh, their ship sank while they were in Antarctica. And this was uh, 19 something before the Titanic, I believe. Um, so there was nobody coming and everybody lived um, that came from that shipwreck. It was 40 odd people um, and nobody died after I think it was a year and a half. I may be wrong on the timeline, but a year and a half of surviving on um, seal meat and um, bit no food. Um, but it just, it, so it serves the idea that if you can work as a team um, in the harshest, worst conditions, as a team, you'll all make it through. Um, if you go out on your own, you won't make it. And it's a, it's a pretty incredible story. Um, and they actually did have a mission, which was to reach the South Pole um, by foot, which was not a good idea. Um, they didn't use skis or anything like that. Uh, so the Norwegians actually beat them there. So they actually noted that it was such a bad idea that if they had actually listened to the people that were really good at this kind of expedition, this may not even have happened in the first place. So listening to people's advice um, that may have a little bit more expertise than you can save you a lot of pain and, and agony uh, in the long run. Mm. Uh, when you said, listen to your team and work as a team, um, I would say, go find your team. If you feel like you're not a part of your team, build a team, you know, be a part of somebody else's team. Um, you are all my team. And I am so grateful uh, to be in my role now um, within the university, within my current role. Um, many of you wrote letters, many of you supported directly or indirectly. Um, build your team if you don't have one, right? Like, it's you're it's so 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 true um and it's funner right more fun it's funner um to to do that so absolutely um whether you're shipwrecked or um you know wanting to make an impact on uh, in the post-secondary world yeah build your teams um okay unless emma has a burning book or podcast um <laughs> i actually do yeah Actually read this during 2020 my mother actually gave it to me because 2020 was just a really weird time just going straight from like everything you know the world's normal and then nothing's normal it's called the defining decade by meg j she's a psychologist like uh, i don't know what ivy league but some fancy ivy league anyway it's talking about how to maximize most of your 20s because a lot of times people in their 20s feel lost or they're not sure what to do or when you graduate university it's a very new world and it's just a book about how to maximize it personally, professionally, uh, in any way, shape or form. And I thought it was a really great book to read, especially in university. And then I reread it after I graduated. And so it was a really just all around great book to read. So I recommend that one. Thank you. Can you um, just repeat um, that author's name and maybe uh, Keisha can grab it and put it in our notes. It was Meg. Meg J, like a J bird. Okay, Meg J, and what was it called? The Defining Decade. I can type it in the chat too. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. All right. And just sticking with you, um, Emma, um, I'm going to put you on the spot first. So, our last question is something that I love to ask um, all of our guests. And that's because um, I'm just very curious to hear the answers. And I often hear from other people that they're interested in this too. So, Emma, uh, and then the rest of you, um, what is your definition of success? That's a good question. Uh, it's actually been a bit of a journey trying to figuring that trying to figure that out because with school it's very easy. 
it's just school and you have marks and everything, but work's a bit different. So I'm finding success is defined in two different spheres of life. You have it professionally and then you have it personally. So professionally, it's getting the feedback from whatever team you're on, how well you did, what you can improve next time, but that's success in my book. But personally, it's trying to find fulfillment in extracurricular activities, whether that's going to like a new workout class, trying a new hike, or spending time with spending time with friends that I haven't seen in a long time. And it's just making a conscientious effort to add value to my everyday life. That success to me is things that aren't necessarily a part of everyday life, but just, you know, something I enjoy and that I want to add to it. So perfect. Thank you, Emma. Thomas, how do you define success? Um, I'd say success can vary person to person. Um, but for me, it's that at the end of the day, I can look back at everything I've done and sort of give myself the nod that I'm happy with all my efforts. Because um, I know that when I walk into a room, I'm probably not the smartest, probably don't have all the X, Y, and Z. Um, but if I'm giving my all at all times, that's something um, to be happy about. And at the end of the day, those efforts pay off and success will follow. So on day by day, um, if I can look back and see that I've worked my hardest all day long, that was a good day. And I feel like I'm on the right track for success. Perfect. Thank you, Thomas. Terry? I think mine would follow a lot of what Thomas said and just being happy in what you put forward. I think it also is like finding balance and like being content in your life, I guess. Like, I don't know, you know, not just grind, 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 grind with no enjoyment. Like, obviously you need to grind to achieve the things you want to achieve, but also being able to take that step back. But I also think that success is a rolling metric and that some days it could be different than others. Like, you know, some days my definition of success is getting out of bed and showering. Whereas other days it's like completing a huge project. Like I think being happy, achieving like little things, depending on maybe your mood on the day or something like that is really important. And like realizing that success isn't always just a huge goal or a salary or something like that. Like sometimes it's just achieving those little tiny things when it may seem impossible. Absolutely. Thank you. Kate, it's never easy to go first, second, third, or, or fourth, but Kate Lee, how do you, do you define success? Um, as cheesy as it sounds, I feel like to me, success is fulfillment. I think if you can wake up in the morning and, and, and go to bed at night and feel fulfilled with the impact that you've made on, you know, whoever you've encountered and the job that you have and things that you create. I think, I think that success, I think often we can look at somebody and say, oh, like they're successful, you know, C-suites and all of these people who fit kind of that cookie cutter definition of success. And I just think at the end of the day, if you're fulfilled, you know, those people might not be fulfilled. We don't, we don't know. And it's, it's going to look different to everyone, you know, what fulfills you. And, but I would say if you're fulfilled with the impact that you make and, and I do think that in, in a career like accounting, there's a lot of room to make an impact at that. I think we don't really recognize. Um, I've been really impacted by a lot of people like Sam, um, you know, some partners that I work with. And I just think being fulfilled with the impact that you make and the things that you do um, is success. I agree. A little bit ago, uh, one of my colleagues asked me what my goal was now, because they're like, you know, I, had, I hit a couple of metrics, a couple of things that I'd wanted to do. And I'm like, you know, I want to do cool shit with fun people. And I, you know, and how I define 
cool shit is, you know, making goals that are meaningful to me that hopefully impact others positively um, and achieve them with, um, with cool, fun people. So with that, thank you for being here because that's you people, right? Um, we build our team. We get to fill our lives um, with the people that bring us up, that support us, that hopefully, you know, we have the opportunity to contribute back. Um, and it, it's a fun it's a fun circle and it's a fun, a fun, fun thing um, that we can do. And yeah, it, it's in accounting. It's um, with the people that we encounter uh, day to day or maybe just once, um, but it's our opportunity to go make and do. So Terry, Thomas, Emma, Kate, thank you uh, for joining me here today. I will be linking to our team page um, because we have all worked on multiple projects together. Um, and if our learners want to reach out to you. Um, I believe that your LinkedIn or your email is linked there. Uh, just a quick nod or a shake heads if uh, you're okay with uh, learners reaching out to you. For sure. All right. Awesome. I'm seeing all the shake heads, all the up and downs. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam.